always seems impossible until it's done. That is a quote by Nelson Mandela. Welcome to Trina Talk. This is the podcast where guests share their stories of pursuing their passions, living a fulfilled life, and empowering others. Each week, I talk with inspiring leaders, business owners, and people with amazing stories from around the world in unscripted conversations as they share their successes and failures. This podcast is all about empowering you to keep striving in your personal and professional life. I am your host, Trina L. Martin. Welcome to episode 175. I am delighted to announce that I'll be speaking at Women in Tech, Texas on 19th through the 20th of May, 2022. This event offers an immersive educational experience for like-minded women to access proven strategies and tools to support them in their mission to achieve their career goals. Registration is now open. Book your pass today and secure a 15% discount with my special discount code. And that code is W-I-T-T-S-P-E-A-K-E-R-15. And the website is www dot women hyphen in hyphen tech hyphen texas dot com. The topic of this week's episode is impossible things. My guest this week is Meredith Alexander. Meredith is a best-selling author, powerhouse mompreneur, and top female motivational speaker who has become known for inspiring high-level professionals and entrepreneurs to venture beyond the place where their beliefs stopped them. All thanks to a plummeting boulder that almost killed her daughter and that changed her old normal into the destiny she embraces today. She challenges you to explore the boundaries of endless possibilities, positive expectations, and deliberate creation. Welcome, Meredith, to Trina Talk. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I am excited to speak with you. Um, we were chatting pre-interview and you just, you're a woman that has done some amazing things and have had some challenges in your life, but you've turned those around and you have an amazing story. So how I like to start off with every guest before we get into the real meat is tell the listeners who you are and what made you the Meredith that you are today. Ooh, um, you know, um, I like to say that I have um, evolved into a person who my primary business now is uh, helping people find the most epic version of themselves and come even more alive and regain that belief in the magic of life uh, that that often we had as a child. And, and it's interesting because I think that the journey that often gets us there is a journey that is um, definitely not an easy one, but I feel that it's that partnership of the moments that are so beautiful that they take our breath away. And those moments that can be so challenging that they knock the wind out of us. And it's that beautiful dance between those that certainly have made me who I am today. Um, but that give me the blessing of being able to help the people that I work with discover what the most epic version of themselves can be. Wow. And I love what you said. You said the most epic version of themselves. And I was just sitting here and I was like, wow, you know, that's a powerful word, the epic version, because most people don't know what that is. Right. Right. And, you know, and I, and I find that even kind of in our common conversation, it's not unusual to have it be acceptable to say, how are you? And you say, oh, I'm fine. So we've gotten 
very conditioned to accept fine Mm -hmm. as good enough. And, um, you know, when we have good enough lives and we have good enough relationships, if we're lucky, Mm -hmm. sometimes that's all we're striving for is I just want it to be good enough, right? Instead of what would it take who would I have to be? Forget about the world having to behave in a certain way. Who do I have to be in order to even know what epic means for me? Most people don't even feel inspired to think about that. And what I've discovered is that, you know, in my own case, it's been several boulders, one that was a literal boulder that forced me to think of that. And as harsh as those moments have been, and as much as I'd never want to relive them, I definitely wouldn't want to live without them. Mm. So if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about that story and the impact that it's had on your life and the reason why you're at this place today where you're helping other people live their epic lives. Sure. Sure. So, um, you know, I, w- I would be the first to say that I was a fairly, quote unquote, normal, single mom entrepreneur, um, trying to be everything to everyone and feeling like I was dramatically failing at all of it. There just wasn't enough of me to go around. Didn't mean I would slow down. I would try and go faster. And I felt like I was accomplishing less. Um so right in the middle of this whirlwind, I'd, I'd had a couple of really um, catastrophic years in my business and my personal life was just kind of ho-hum. My children, two out of three of my kids had graduated and gone on to be starting wonderful careers for themselves. And my youngest child had just graduated from Yale. She had been traveling the world, um, teaching English, doing all sorts of incredible things. And she inspired me tremendously and yet made me feel like I'm just, who am I? And I'm not good enough. And I found myself comparing myself to other parents out there and thinking, oh, I don't measure up. I'm not this. I'm not that. And then at 3.15 in the afternoon on a Friday afternoon, the phone rang and the voice on the other end said, "Um, I don't know how to tell you this, but Skylar, my youngest, has been in a terrible accident while we were down in Colombia, South America. And we need to get you down here as soon as possible. And if, if, at first, of course, it was total denial. I was thinking, well, it sounds like she just has a broken leg. And mm-hmm. the more this young woman who had been with her talked with me, it, it led me to finally say, well, she's going to make it, isn't she? And that silence as that young woman fidgeted trying to figure out how to respond to that told me volumes. And so I remember hanging up the phone and absolutely collapsing on the floor and saying, I'm not big enough for this. You know, I am the wrong person to be her mom right now. I'm not up for this challenge And um, then it was almost as if I became two people. There was one who was just kind of watching things evolve and the other who was trying desperately to figure out what next. And um, so the first thing I did was try to call my family, you know, my other two children, my mom, and things began to whirlwind into place. And before I knew it, um, my oldest daughter and I were on a plane headed down to Colombia, South America, not speaking the language. The only idea I had about Colombia was what I'd seen on Hollywood with drug lords and everything. So I had <laughs> no idea what I was walking into. But ironically enough, this is really when it felt like the magic started happening for us because 
thankfully in my throughout my life, different challenges and turns turns of events had led me to really develop a fascination with the what I call the inner game and how some people could face these incredible challenges and emerge bigger, bolder versions of themselves. So I had spent decades studying those people, studying those techniques, whether it was, you know, a Japanese martial art, Aikido, or whether it was personal development, that kind of thing, even law of attraction, right? I've been immersing myself in them. So as I sat on that plane, I realized that the worst emotion that I was feeling was feeling powerless to help my daughter. I could handle the fear. I could handle the despair. I could handle the blame, but being powerless was where it had to stop, where it was unacceptable. And so I looked at the elements that I felt that I could control. There weren't many. And it came down to saying, you know what? I may not be able to control anything in the outer game, but I sure as heck can play a mean inner game. So game on. And that is where I made a promise to my daughter and to myself that I would play this inner game like it had never been played before. Um, Because the ultimate thing was at stake here. And so one of the first things I did was say, what could my mind believe? Because I knew that what we focus on expands and what I see, even working with my clients where most people derail themselves as they fall prey to what I call blind spot thinking. And that is when we believe we're focusing on one thing, but we're actually focusing on the exact opposite. The lack of that. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. And and just to give us some better clarity, what happened to your daughter, if you don't mind saying that the accident so, happened? Sure. So Skye had been on a rafting trip um, at the next to last day. She had gone with this uh, friend who was going to be her future boss because Skye was in South America building schools and working with the indigenous population. Um, they had decided, uh, she and this young woman had decided to go on a trip to Colombia for two weeks. This was the day before they were supposed to return to Peru. And um, on this rafting trip, they went through the dangerous part, but they ended up in a grotto with this tourist group um, where they could jump off of a ledge. Mm -hmm. And so in order to get to that ledge, they had to scale this kind of precarious little cliff. And what we believe happened is because they had to go up single file and it was dry season is that someone inadvertently, when they just stepped wrong on one of those boulders and it dislodged the boulder, the boulder came and cracked open her skull, knocked her off the cliff onto the rocks below, which fractured her spine Uh, fractured both scapula, crushed her lungs, snapped her right thigh, um, and pulverized her left ankle. So they, it took them an hour to get her to a hospital in Columbia that even had an ICU because it's very different than here in the U S um, the ICUs are all privately owned. So very few hospitals have them. Um, so they had, so it took them more than an hour to get her to a place where she could be operated on. And now understand that I was later told that four of her injuries are typically so life-threatening that the person who experiences them never makes it to a hospital, much less has an hour of lead time to get there. So, um, the prognosis was grim to say the very least. Wow. How is she today? She, well, she 
is still where, what it has really, she survived the unsurvivable Mm -hmm. basically. I mean, it, we, we saw miracle after miracle after miracle evolve. Um, It was almost as if once I was able to inch my way Mm -hmm. from despair to a little bit of hope, hope to a little bit of belief, belief to this powerful, full feeling of knowing, um, which is, I can only equate to what some people call faith, Mm -hmm. a place where with total calm, medical impossibility after medical impossibility began happening. And so four months later, we were, uh, the, we were able almost immediately, um, to get her from Columbia to Miami. She underwent procedures for four months in Miami and ultimately was released from the hospital. But when she was released, she could barely swallow. She couldn't lift her arms up. She couldn't sit up by herself. She definitely couldn't walk. She had double vision, no peripheral vision. Um, So the lasting effects have been to her damage. I mean, to her damage, to her balance. Um, And so um, that has been one of the most um, life-changing elements for both of us, because all of a sudden I was dropped in the role of being her caregiver, which of course I had no training with that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and especially as a single mom, it, you know, talk about only having so much time to go around. Right. So, um, it also delivered a huge financial hit to my business because, um, I did try, but I can um, honestly share that you cannot make cold calls from an ICU room. It's just not a good idea. Right. Um, so, um, but today, I mean, her tenacity mm-hmm. is incredible. I mean, we work constantly with her. Now she is able to be spotted and walk short distances with a walker. Mm -hmm. Um, She's primarily still in a wheelchair because of the balance. But Mm -hmm. I mean, these tiny little victories become huge victories for us. The victory of being able to go from the wheelchair and transfer onto her bed, basically with someone there just to catch her just in case is cause for a huge celebration. So it's really helped us to appreciate the tiny things in our life. And, you know, and it's so amazing. And I, I too, I am a single mother as well. Um, so my heart goes out to you and, you know, prayers and that she gets better and better and better. But when you have that kind of challenge that happens to you and that's how challenges happens, right? We never are prepared for them. Right. We, we don't know where that is going to come from. And I think you said it earlier, basically, you know, you have the the two thoughts, right? It's almost like, I remember the Flintstones where you have the, the good me, the bad me, you know, you have the, I can do this. Then you have, oh God, I can't do this. Yeah. When, how did you come out of that? Like you said, where you're, you're now able to embrace those small things as, victories and be so grateful and so helpful. How, how do you do it? So for me, um, it really evolved, um, from reuniting with that inner game training a bit and really taking a look at it. And, and there were, several aha moments that really changed, you know, turned my life around, completely changed my perspective on life. And, and I remember one of them was actually, I was literally sitting in the hospital chapel in Miami at Jackson Memorial, um, because it was this beautiful, quiet little space with stained glass wall. And I was staring at this wall and I was still kind of thinking, 
am I capable of this? And yet at the same time, I looked back at two incidents, one when I'd been in a really abusive relationship, and the other was that horribly shaming experience of having had someone really kind of backstab me in my business, leaving me in, in, owing incredibly amounts of money. Um, and the shame I felt from that. And I realized that in both in both of those, I had known that I should feel grateful and foot should feel forgiveness, but it had felt impossible. It felt like intellectually, I get it, but in my heart, I just, I, I can't. And so I was able to look at this with such awe, realizing that it was precisely those bitter, harsh emotions that I felt in each of those experiences that had driven me more deeply into studying some of these inner game things, into becoming that more epic version of myself, that stronger version of myself that allowed me to be the mom that my daughter needed at that moment. I had begun, I was so invested in the energy of that needed to be behind Skylar to fortify her because I realized that she knew people all around the world. And if people all around the world were envisioning her on the brink of death, that's where she would go. And so I realized that I had to do everything in my power to shift that focus toward the presence of where we wanted her to end up. So, so I started updating people with a page on Facebook called Sky is the Limit, but spelled like her name, S-C-H-U-Y, Sky is the Limit. And instead of posting pictures of her in the hospital and, and oh my God, pray for Sky, mm-hmm. it was all powerful pictures of her at her best traveling the world and and saying to people, look, if you want to support us, you find your inner Skylar, that best version of yourself. You go out there and you smile at strangers. You do what you've always wanted to do. You live your dreams. You risk the I'm possible, right? And um, so all of a sudden we started getting not the hundred people that I thought I was updating, but thousands of people. And that is ultimately what evolved into the book that we, you know, that ended up being published. And so it, what I realized was that I couldn't judge uh, definitely at the time I lived through it, those horrible moments in my life. But if they were the lead to so much positive motion in the future, who am I to judge this moment that we're going through right now, right here? So I was able to kind of forgive those moments, forgive myself for having judged those moments, and even forgive this boulder and forgive the world for putting this at our feet and instead investing in the expectation that this would lead to something epic. And it was simply up to me to be open to finding that and ditto for Skylar. Wow. You know, and that's so amazing. And I love it. And I love your positivity but in the midst of that all, mm-hmm. where did you, where did you find that clarity to say that, to say, because like you said, most people be on Facebook saying, oh my God, pray for my daughter, you know, da, 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 da. But you took it and you turned it around to her best moments and mm-hmm. you told people to live their best lives. Where did you get that clarity in the midst of everything that you were going through at that time to do that? How, I mean, did you... 
read about that? Did you have training about that? How did that just happen, come into your mind? So that to me is the beauty that I really advocate to all of us of trusting the process of Mm -hmm. life, even when it appears to be working against you, because it really is thanks to those moments that did knock the wind out of me that I paid attention, that I took it seriously, that I fought to find that tougher, stronger version of myself. And that ultimately I, a lot of what I embraced um, was from the teachings of Esther Hicks, uh, Abraham Hicks and law of attraction that resonated deeply with me. And I had been thanks to these horrific experiences in my life. I had been listening and playing with those concepts for about 10 years. And as I took inventory on that plane of what I had available, because respectfully, I mean, there's never, it's never too late per se, but in the middle of a crisis is not the time to learn to be resilient. I mean, you dang well better do the best you can to be resilient. But this is one reason why our inner game is so important. We tend to want to rush beyond it and just focus on the outer game. It's like, give me the results, give me this and get all these pieces into play so that I can just react in a way that's going to feel good. I don't want to invest in all of this. I'm learning how to feel good for myself and all that airy fairy sort of crap. Well, it's not airy fairy stuff. It's, it's literally epic producing stuff. Mm -hmm. And when we, and the, the interesting thing is, is that this knowledge of how valuable it can be for us as human beings has been around for thousands of years. We just keep looking for a shortcut. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I love what you call it, the inner game. I I love that because until we can get our inner selves, like you were saying, there's nothing external that really matters or that's going to happen because it all comes from within. And I know a lot of times, at least for me, you know, you ha- you're at that point where you can put on that facade of the outer game, right? You can say, Oh, well, you know, yes, I'm, I'm this, I'm that I'm strong. But then yourself tells you, yeah, no, you're not. Or I feel shame about this, or I don't forgive myself for this mistake. And all of these things run through your head. Mm-hmm. How do you help your clients or, or how did you even help yourself when, because that that's a lot of self-talk, right? That's something that's right. very powerful. You right. Know, you put, Everybody right. puts on the best dress suit or dress when they go out. But then when yeah. you come home, you have to deal with yourself. Right. And, and, and. Uh, in my opinion, you just mentioned one of the most critical elements, and it is the self-talk slash inner narrative. Mm-hmm. So the way that I have distilled it and look at it and and share it with my clients and help them move to a place where they are not their own worst enemy begins with looking at our minds almost as a jukebox. Okay. Imagine one of those old timey jukeboxes that used to be in those really cool diners. Mm -hmm. And there were two ways to get recordings, to get music out of there. One was to walk up and deliberately put your money in it and pick the record that you wanted to hear, right? The other way though, was to go back and sit at your booth and just eat your food. And the jukebox 
was going to fill that void by playing random selection of records that are in that jukebox. Well, how do you get to be one of those records in the jukebox? They certainly don't pull us before we walk in the restaurant. What they do is they, the criteria is it can't be a new song, can't be something that people have never heard before. It has to be something that is played over and over and over again in the past because they don't certainly don't have captive live musicians in a jukebox. So these are all recordings that have been played a lot. Okay. So my next question to you would be, have you ever had the experience of having a song stuck in your mind? Yes. So is it fair for me to guess that maybe sometime that you've had a song stuck in your mind, it wasn't really a song. It was one part of Mm. a song that played over and over again, just a part of a song. Mm -hmm. And if I can risk even more, it might not even have been a song that you liked. That is true. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily one of your favorites. Right. So we've gotten quite used to that happens to all of us. And it's never like when we're in the middle of a crisis, climbing a mountain, really focused on something. It's more when we're just kind of like, la, 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 doing the housework or just in the car buzzing around if we don't have the radio on or something like that. That's when the song pops in. Right. We're not deliberately programming the jukebox. So the jukebox gives us a song. Mm -hmm. Well, If the jukebox will give us a song to fill up that space, why on earth would we believe that some of the other records that our mind, the jukebox, plays are not just regurgitated words and phrases and sentences that we've heard over and over and over again? We just don't recognize them because they don't have a melody attached to them. So instead of going, oh, eh, that's just a song stuck in my mind, we go, oh my gosh, I have to listen to that. I have to ponder this. Mm -hmm. This, it sounds like my mom. Well, maybe it is your mom, right? Maybe it is her mom's mom and their mom's mom, generations of that particular chatter. So all of a, all of a sudden it becomes like a big crapshoot. What were you surrounded by? What were you hearing in abundance that got tagged away as the top golden hits to be replayed when you weren't deliberately saying to your mind, the jukebox, okay, let's think about this. In fact, the more you hear those, the more you start to think, oh my gosh, that's who I am. That's just the way I'm wired. It is what it is. Well, it isn't what it is. Right. Does this does it? Can you see this? How this just slips in and we don't realize that our mind, if we are not deliberately becoming the sovereign of our thoughts, we're in the diner on the booth munching on hamburgers and just taking whatever song comes our way. Mm hmm. I never looked at it like that, but that is so true. So true. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. So, man. So how do we start to reel that in? Okay. So uh, first of all, to recognize that it's a possibility. And in fact, that this is real logical. If you think about it, that this is going on. And so from there to start committing to being more deliberate with your thoughts and to realize that you have a right to be deliberate with your thoughts. Because I mean, think about it, To allow your mind to just play whatever hit parade it wants to play of whatever 
phrases and thoughts and ideas you've been surrounded with the most is like getting off the exit of a highway, being hungry and saying, oh, there's a Kentucky fried chicken. It's there. I've got to eat it. And oh my, there's a Burger King next door to it too. Better stop there and eat that too. And oh, there's a Cracker Barrel. Well, we got to see We got to stop there. I mean, true. We would never consider doing that with feeling obligated to eat everything on the buffet table. So why do we do it with the things that are the most impactful and precious to how we live our lives, our inner narrative? And yet we do. And I love that. And it's, it's interesting to me because that's something that I've really been working on with myself is the mm-hmm. inner narrative. But how do you, let's just say I'm a person who thinks in lack, okay? Mm-hmm. I, I never have enough. Oh right. my God, you know, um, how do I change that? How do I, how do I get unstuck? How, you know, I'm not that scratch on the record, yeah. brilliant, right? So there are two, yep. Yeah. So there, there are two two different ways that you can begin with that. Um, The first uh, is to become aware. For example, I would say 99.99999% of the people who come to me for the coaching arrive making this statement. Well, my biggest challenge is blank, fill in the blank. My biggest challenge is this. The the big problem is this, right? So when we say my biggest challenge is, what do you think is the most powerful word in that sentence? Challenge. And that was a trick question because... (laughs) Every single word that we mentioned, quite honestly, Mm -hmm. is very powerful. Challenge, of course, to your point, has these hidden stories and affiliations attached to that word when you use it like that in that statement. And so it's implying difficulty and pain and impossibility even. And I've tried everything and it never works for me. And I'm sick of this. Why I don't, I deserve it by now. All of those associations with that word, but then we take it and we add on the word biggest. Mm. Well, you can't have big S if you only have one challenge, can you? No. So now you've subconsciously added that you have a lot of challenges and this one is the grand poop of them all. So all of a sudden challenge got even heavier, right? But we don't stop there. It's kind of like the, you know, the QVC or HSN, but wait, there's more, right? (laughs) We don't say the biggest challenge. We say my biggest challenge. So now we've made it part of our identity part of who we are. So it's like, hi, you have an opportunity for me. I'm Meredith with two eyes, a nose, a mouth, and this whole stream of challenges. So I'm going to respond to this opportunity as Meredith with this biggest challenge, which is going to impact my emotions and reactions, my decisions for action, and ultimately the results I get. Mm -hmm. However, Even more powerful than those three words is a word that we tend to totally ignore. And this is why it's so dangerous. It's the word is. So it has the potential to be dangerous or it has the potential to be magical. Is is our present tense. It is a statement of fact, never to be questioned. It is the foundation of our castle. It is the programming code for our subconscious. So when we make a statement in the present tense, this is, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. It's like when we say my problem is, that is truth, man, with all capital letters. Right. Right. So the programming code for the future has now been embossed into the subconscious. 
right? Mm -hmm. So we're dooming ourselves to creating more of it and going, why did that happen? I never would have wanted that, but we're focusing it into being every moment we make those kind of statements. So how do we change that? This is where the awareness comes in. It's not for most people going in front of the mirror and spreading your arms wide and saying, I'm a money magnet when your mind is saying, have you checked your bank account recently? Unless you really believe that this is foolproof and will not work, it tends to actually have you focusing on the lack of what you want rather than in a position where you're actually attracting the presence of what you want, Mm -hmm. because it has to be believable to your mind. So how do we take my biggest challenge is whatever and make it believable? A simple adjustment. Instead of saying my biggest challenge is it has to be authentic. How about My big focus right now is finding a way to blank, right? Or even better, the big opportunity that I'm so excited to master right now is this. Or even better, my biggest commitment right now is to figuring out a way to do blank or to solve blank, right? Now, all of a sudden, it feels like, oh, get out of my way. I've got the power to do this. Yeah. Right. And, and to go back to the blind spot thinking to your point, most people have no idea they're focusing on the lack because to them focusing on the presence looks like this. Meredith, where do you want to be a year from now? So your average Meredith would probably say something like, oh boy, a year from now. Yeah. A year from now, I definitely want to be making well into the six figures. Um, Definitely want to be in a bigger house. I need, I need more storage. Definitely. And maybe even God, I'd love to have a house with a pool and um, I want to be healthy. I want to be a year from now. I want to be working out like five days a week. In fact, Mm -hmm. I want to be, I want to, I, I definitely want to lose 20 pounds and I want to be working at something when I'm not surrounded by so many toxic people. I really want like more positively focused people in my life. Right. So can you hear how that's unfolding? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Were you like, woo, giddy and excited as you hear me talking about that? No, it was, it's actually was pretty negative, even though you were saying, oh, I want this. Yeah, it was pretty negative. (laughs) And, and the, the, the energy is very heavy. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it was actually a checklist of things that are lacking. Mm. Right. Yeah. And so even I believed, even though I believed that what I was talking about was what I wanted, my focus was completely on the lack of the presence of what it is that I really want, right? So contrast it to really getting more familiar with our imagination and how to turn that into our superpower. We're really adept at using our imagination to worry and to build fear. That we've decided is a legitimate use of our imagination. We're allowed to do that all day long. And a lot of people call that being realistic. Right. Right. Yep. But it's it's kind of like Will Smith made famous in the aftermath or after Earth movie um, that fear is a it is not real that fear is a story that your imagination creates about a future that has never happened and probably never will happen danger is real fear is not mm-hmm. right so we worry and fear is simply milking the unfamiliar and turning it into something that 
that frightens us, Mm -hmm. right? We associate that physiological feeling. It's just an energy. And we put the label up. That's fear. That's worry. That's anxiety, right? Puts it really heavy on that. Um, When we can start embracing the potential of our imagination and the legitimacy of our imagination to envision the presence, in other words, to almost help us dress rehearse for the big production when we actually achieve some of these things, to be that epic version of ourselves, then in my experience, it begins to look as if life has to conform to that vision. Mm. So it looks a lot like this instead. If you had asked Meredith where she wants to be, where she intends to be a year from now, it would look more like, um, oh my gosh, a year from now, a year from now, the moment that I open my eyes in the morning and feel that incredible sun coming in the window of the master bedroom of this dream house that I have been yearning for for so long. I am going to feel exhilarated. I'm going to look out the other window. I'm going to see the most magnificent pool that you have ever imagined with the waterfalls and the fire pit and the whole nine yards going on. And I am going to know that when I go to my computer and I turn it on and I go to my bank account, I am going to love what I'm seeing. In fact, I probably will have seen even more money flowing in even while I speak. And I will be so jazzed by my day. And I don't care if things get, if if challenges are up during the day, because I know that I am surrounded by the most incredible people. And I know that I have the capability, not only of rolling right over these challenges, but extracting from them things that are going to become my rocket fuel going forward. Right? Mm -hmm. So you can see the difference in energy there. Yeah. It's almost as if I'm there already and I'm describing it to you, what the experience is like. Yeah. And the emotion is feeding me, feeding me and getting crystal clear about the target for my subconscious in the same time. And a lot of neuroscience these days is really supporting that. And, and, you know, it's not such a novel idea to have like the Super Bowl teams or the Olympic athletes out there. They're not imagining, do you know what the odds are that you're going to get hurt on the field out there? (laughs) Think about it. Do you know how tough these opponents are? It's not a topic of the locker room conversation. So why, again, on earth would we do that in some of the greatest opportunities of our own life? Wow. It makes so much sense. I mean, it just really is because, like you said earlier, it's not just a matter of standing in front of a a mirror saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to have a million dollars when you and and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, I'm never going to have a million dollars. You actually have to see it and and I guess manifest it, claim it, whatever you want to say, but not just talk it like, okay, let me just say it just because, oh, that's what they told me I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to stand here in front of this mirror and say nice things to myself. And it, yes. And to your point, it's important that you create a bridge to get there. And your bridge is is your mind and your thoughts. So to go from I'm $50,000, $100,000 in debt to I'm going to be a millionaire is probably not something, again, remember, it has to be believable. It's what can you control and what can your mind believe? Probably can't really believe that. What you can believe is, you know what? I confess I'm feeling, not I'm, I'm feeling like crap right now. However, I can be pretty sure that some of those people who have a million dollars right now had a moment when they were sitting by themselves and they didn't feel any better than I'm feeling right now. In fact, some of them may even have felt worse. Mm -hmm. 
And I also know that I have a heck of a lot of tenacity. And no, I haven't really gone for a million dollars yet, but I have gone for some other things in my life. And there was a time when even learning to ride my bike felt as impossible that it earning a million dollars feels to me. And did I fall a few times? Absolutely. And yet I got back up and that's who I am. I'm the kind of person who gets back up. And I know that the people who've made a million dollars, they're people who get back up. So it's logical to believe that I may not get it on the first time, but I sure am going to get back up and keep getting back up and keep getting back up until I find my way to that magic that's going to earn me a million dollars. I know I'm going to get there, right? That, that's a bridge that you can walk across. Yes, 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 yes. I love it. I mean, it, it does. It makes great sense. It's, and, and like you're saying, it's actually something that you can do. You're yes. not just saying, Oh yeah, tomorrow I'm going to, I'm going to win the lottery because we all know, right. yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> right. right. But if, like you said, if you're saying, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm in this spot right now, but I'm going to work. I can do everything I can because I know I can come out of this. Right. That's a different story. Absolutely. And, and, and often the beginning of the bridge is looking at other people. That's why it's so important to share your story and to listen to other people's stories. Wow. Amazing. 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 I love it. Wow. Talk about your books. So um, the, the, the one book that is available right now, I do <laughs> have another one about some of these techniques that that I'm working on right now that is stems from my coaching business. Cause now I've, I've coached, I believe it or not, hundreds of clients at this point and, and had the opportunity to speak to corporations. And it's been amazing. This, the, the book, the sky is the limit that you see behind me is it, it happened by accident as do have many things in my life, which um, I kind of joke now when I say by accident, because clearly it's it's a process that I just wasn't necessarily privy to. But um, so, as I mentioned, I had written these posts on on Facebook on sky is the limit. And we had a lot of people who are following them and people would stop us in airports and, you know, faraway places saying, I don't want to bother you, but I just wanted to share how much your posts and your story has inspired me. And they would go on to tell me and tell Skylar how this had impacted their lives. And so on one of those occasions, one of uh, the women who was sharing with us said, when are you going to publish it into a, those posts into a book? And I kind of looked at her with this odd expression and said, why would you want it in a book when it's on Facebook? And she said, well, you know, not everybody reads Facebook and more and more time is passing. And I would just love to have it, to hold it, to be able to highlight it. And I thought, huh, that's such an intriguing idea. So I literally got home, thought about it thought, well, I guess I could take those first four months. I could write an opening chapter, an ending chapter, put it in big, bold print so that Sky could read it because she hadn't read them at that point. And I, I literally went onto the internet a little bit and figured out what kind of cover I would want. I went to Fiverr. Two days later, I had that cover. And a little over a month later, it went live on, on Amazon and became one of the hot new releases in one of the motivational categories. And so it was, it was really incredible in the sense that it allowed people to see the actual power of the inner game in action, as opposed to I wasn't going back. I didn't change anything 
I left absolutely everything from the moment that I got that call to four months later. I left everything for people to see because throughout the entire span of those posts, for the most part, it was uncertain that she would make it. And so these posts were all written with that uncertainty, if not medical impossibility in the equation. So for people to be able to look at that knowing and to be able to apply that to their own story and their own processing method and to really see what was going on here has been very inspiring for people. So um, it's it's still available on Amazon and I'll I'll give you the link in, in case your your listeners want to have a listen to it. Um, and and of course, um, stay tuned because like I said, I am actually now I've had so many people asking about the process. Um, clearly, Grit Mindset Academy um, has evolved into, Uh, something that I never dreamed it would evolve into. So I do a lot of speaking and a lot of uh, everything from group training to one-on-one training. I do have um, actually a program that's, that's called Unleash the Epic You that really is targeted about discovering who that future version of you is and getting crystal clear on where you want to go, why you want to go there, what's in your way and how can you transform that? And then how can you actually take action plan to get out there and live that? So um, it's been incredibly impactful for me. I've seen so many transformations and um, people's lives change, people's perspectives change, um, people's level of joy and achievement Mm -hmm. change because they tend to be hand in hand. This episode is being sponsored by True Vision. Have you lost hope in starting your business, lost steam, or just do not know where to go from here? See with True Vision and define your path. The True Vision Project seeks to heal, rebuild, and transform your online business from the inside out. For more information and early access for only Trina Talk listeners into the True Vision Project, send an email to connect at definingpaths.info. Make sure to mention that you heard about it on Trina Talk. Wow. That's amazing. We're going to jump into the questions. And then after Perfect. that, you can you can give us the um, links on how the listeners, if they want to work with you coaching, that they can do that. Perfect. Okay. Who or what motivates you? Oh, that's an easy one. My daughter motivates me. She is uh, unbelievable. She, her, Sachi is her middle name, and that means happiness in Japanese. And she is, uh, she is eternally loving life and celebrating the joy of being alive. So absolutely. What demotivates you? What demotivates me? Um, Seeing people believe that the truth is that they're less than who they capable of being, that the world is stacked against them and that the only way out of it is to, to fight and to be furious and to wait for the world to be different in order for them to really come alive. Mm. When was a time that something was said or done to hurt you, but it worked out for your good? Hmm. That would probably be that period of my life when I was in an abusive relationship. I really was. It was so abusive that I got to the point where I didn't have enough adrenaline to spare that I could even drive on the highway. 
I would have panic attacks if I even thought of getting on the highway. And it was a really dark and scary time for me. And yet it inadvertently, and this again is the mystery, the beauty, the magic of life. One of the little areas of solace I used to take was reading little dragon books where good would vanquish evil. And on one of my little forays to the bookstore, I walked into the fantasy section and literally wham on the floor fell the Abraham Hicks book, Ask and It Is Given. Hmm. And clearly with the title like that, when I was in such desperate yearning, I picked it up and I opened it and ended up taking it home. And it not only transformed my life, but became that rock solid foundation that I would fall back on when the boulder came crashing into Skylar. What is your fear? What is my fear? You know, it's really interesting because I, I mean, clearly I fear danger. I mean, real legit danger, right? I mean, if, if, if there was real legitimate news that an asteroid was heading toward the planet, I would be as fearful (laughs) as everybody else, but all that aside, it's really interesting because through this practice, um, I really have become more of a sovereign of my thoughts. So I really do my set point is very different now. My set point is really focusing as much time and energy on possibilities. Mm -hmm. So I don't really, to me, it's a waste of time endorsing or, or even really letting my imagination kind of go into a, a fear. When I work with my clients, I'm, I think one of the reason that I have the kind of success that I have is that I don't buy into the permanency of the damage mm-hmm. that they may feel they have or the hopelessness of the conditions of life out there. So fear is, I think fear is, 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 is relative. I have tons of, of hope and exhilaration and excitement, but if it's not something that's tangible danger, I can't, I honestly can't think of anything that I fear. Yeah. What is your definition of success? Mm. Success to me is really appreciating and allowing yourself to totally dive into the dance, the beautiful dance between those moments that are so brilliant and so wonderful and so exciting. And those moments that none of us really like that aren't pleasant to experience that are what we call the hits. Right. And yet the partnership, the partnering and the dance of those two is so magnificent so that when we can trust that process and keep our eye on potential and be willing to transform the initial knee-jerk reaction of impossible into the I'm possible, that to me, that's the sweet spot where success lies. Mm. What are you awesome at? Ooh, um, you know, um, I think I'm awesome at exploring epicness in all shapes and forms. I'm, um, 
Yeah, I'm definitely an an epicness explorer. Um, I love finding the limitlessness of epicness within myself, within my daughter, within the clients that I work with, within the world, just the, the epicness is something that excites me passionately. And I think that makes me awesome. Wow. At it. Wow. Give the listeners one motivational takeaway. Ooh, one motivational takeaway. Um, I think that the motivational takeaway would be just when you are feeling like you're really stuck is when the sweetest part of your adventure is just beginning. It's just a matter of learning where to look and learning what you shouldn't be looking for. Mm. Hmm. That was very good. Tell the listeners how they can connect with you, get your book, get your coaching. Every day. Sure. Um, well, you'll find me under Meredith Alexander on, um, you know, the usual places, LinkedIn and Facebook, of course, um, grit mindset Academy dot com is my coaching website. Uh, MeredithAlexander.com is where you'd go if you want to have me speak. Um, but if you would like, if you are feeling stuck or if you are feeling the calling that now's the time that you are maybe not where you thought you would be at this point in your life and you are ready to blow through whatever limits feel like they're in front of you, then uh, I would invite you to go to bit.ly. So that's B I T dot L Y uh, forward slash go epic now. So go epic now and go ahead and grab one of the 20 minute complimentary strategy calls with me. They're all with me. So it's not like you'll be speaking with someone on my team with me. And let's explore Epic and what that may mean for you. And if I can help you, I will. If I want to steer you in, an, in a direction that I think that will help you, I will. Um, but I would invite you to do it and do it now. Um, there's no better time to really unleash that Epic version of yourself. We only, I, well, I like to say that, um, there's, you know, we don't always get to control how long we get to play here on this beautiful planet, but we do get to control how epically we live while we're playing here. Yeah. And there's no excuse to go f- through your life feeling just fine. <laughs> Epic is an entirely new dimension and you don't get a second shot at it. Wow. Meredith, thank you for being on Trina Talk. It's been a great and an enlightening conversation. I I love it. I love the whole, you know, the changing the narrative from how you see yourself and the things you tell yourself. So I I really, I love that. And I believe the listeners have gotten some very great insights from you. So I really thank you for being on today. Well, thank you so much to your listeners. And Trina, thank you so much for inviting me to be on your amazing podcast. So until next time. Yes, yes. If you like Trina Talk Podcast, please don't forget to go out to iTunes and rate it five stars and leave a review. Also, who else in your life do you know that needs some motivation and inspiration in their life? Don't forget to share Trina Talk with them. I hope you have a great week. And remember, if you change your mindset, you can change your life. Keep striving because success is a journey, not a destination.